Are you ready for some good news? The gospel of Jesus is a free gift that can't be bought, it can't be earned, and it can't be lost. The work of Jesus is for all people who receive his completed work in faith. We're continuing for the next several weeks in the story of Elisha. We started our year at Elijah, and now we're on to Elisha. And today we come to a familiar story because we as a church talked about it nearly a year ago. And it marks one of the most remarkable conversions, I believe, in the entire Bible. The idea of the second in command of Syria, Naaman, going to Israel for help would be the same as if Stephen Hawking going to Billy Graham to talk about issues of faith and reason. You would say, that doesn't seem to be consistent with what I know about Stephen that he would go to Billy Graham. That's the kind of contrast that we're looking at here. In Greek tragedy, as we're going to see in Naaman's story here, it is often the tragedy itself that wakes up the person from the delusion and the illusion that they can do it on their own. See, when you're removed from that kind of delusion that you can do it on your own is when you begin to find the help that you need. One of the lies of the devil in the Bible is the lie of self-sufficiency. The lie that if you would remove yourself from authority, then you could find true freedom. After all, this is the lie of the serpent in the garden. The serpent encounters Adam and Eve, and he convinces them that God didn't surely tell them that they would die if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That God didn't really mean that they would die, but God is deceiving them keeping them oppressed because God knows that if Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of that tree, then their eyes will surely be opened and they will see as he sees. See, the lie of the serpent in the garden is that you will find freedom if you remove yourself from authority. And what Adam and Eve found is bondage. See, self-reliance, the idea that you can do it on your own, the idea that you can gird up your loins, put on your bootstraps, and do it on your own is a lie. And Naaman's first step towards his gospel encounter is when he realizes, as a spiritual seeker, that self-reliance, the ability that he can make himself well, is a lie. And here you're going to see that Elisha knows the real problem Naaman has isn't his skin condition. That's easy. The real issue that Naaman has is a sin condition. Because Elisha knows what Naaman's about to realize, and there's no such thing as private faith. That when you've been transformed by Jesus in the way that Naaman has been transformed by the God of Israel, what happens is is that everything you do at that point revolves around the story of that God. His mind has changed. It has been renewed by placing faith in the God of Israel. The things that used to matter to him no longer matter. So you can imagine what's going to happen when Naaman goes back and all of the wealth that he'd accumulated his whole life. First of all, he gets to take it back and he's healed, so something's up. But he goes back and he begins to give it away. He begins to say, it doesn't matter to me anymore. So the poor people who don't have much, I'm going to give part of my wealth to them. And the people who are homeless, I'm going to build a home for them. And people begin to say, Naaman, this is inconsistent with what I've known about your character. Like you were selfish and you were angry and you didn't show self-control and you weren't loving and you weren't kind and you weren't patient. You come back from this trip and your skin is healed and now your whole character has changed. And Naaman tells the people of Syria, I had an encounter with the one true God. All the things that used to matter no longer matter to me. The point of that story is that servant girl. Naaman's army had attacked the tribes of Israel. And in doing so, they had pillaged all of the goods and services and military might of Israel. But more than that, it is likely that they killed most of the adults in Israel. 
And as you would kill a family, it was against Syrian law to kill a child. So it's very likely that as Naaman and his army were attacking, they would either send those kids into exile, into makeshift orphanages where they would be raised by foreign countries, or they would bring those children home as slaves in their own home. Which means it's very likely that Naaman had killed this girl's parents. In the middle of warfare, he'd probably kicked down the door to her home. As she hid in the corner, he probably put her parents to death. And he brought her back to Syria with him, where she lives in his household as his slave. She would have been bitter, you would think, to serve the man who killed her family. And it seems in the natural that as his skin deteriorated and he was rejected by the culture and by friends and by family, maybe one day he'd have to be quarantined or left on the side of the road. Wouldn't it be great to see the once former prime minister of Syria rotting away on the street side as children screamed in horror as they saw him and other adults mocked him. Wouldn't that be just desserts for the little girl from Israel who was now a servant? How could she have gotten to the place where she offered the healing suggestion to the man who had murdered her family? and taken her off into a distant land. I mean, someone had to pay the price for her suffering. It would be totally appropriate for this little servant girl to throw back the suffering she was experiencing, the blame for it, on Naaman. Every word on every page of all of Scripture tells one story about one man who interrupted human history to save the people who caused him to suffer. Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears shears its silence. So he opened not his mouth. Naaman couldn't believe this good news. Was it really that simple? Was it really true that all that he had to offer couldn't buy the favor of the prophet of Israel and thus the God of Israel? Had the suffering servant really sent him to Elisha because she knew all he had to do was simply believe. The suffering servant came and died in your place for your sins so that God could write a new story of hope and redemption and healing. The suffering servant came to die in your place for your sins so that you would never have to despair alone. It seems too good to be true. But the suffering servant, Jesus the Christ, came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. And that's the gospel.